for 2025 term of Girl Up USA. I'm a rising senior from Southwest Florida, and recently my state enacted legislation that prohibits abortions after just six weeks of conception. Consequently, thousands of women in my state are being denied sufficient access to healthcare, the time and space to make a case against their sexual violence, and overarchingly the clarity to make and justify a choice. However, in this scenario, I do have hope because there is something we can all do about this. Participate in our democracy and vote. Amidst our political dissonance in America now more than ever, it is imperative to understand and embrace the role that democracy has in voicing our political rights. The inspiring women on this panel today are a testament to the success and strength of applying your voice and demonstrate the collective power that we can achieve. With that being said, I am first ecstatic to introduce Erica Leitman, a civic engagement and social impact consultant who has served on numerous national political campaigns. In 2020, Erica co-founded Ready to Launch, a Los Angeles-based nonprofit organization that expands equitable opportunity for women to learn about staff careers in government and politics. Erica centers her passion, building a stronger future for young people, women, people of color, and the LGBTQ plus community. <laughs> Next, I'm excited to introduce Krista Nimmers, the policy and campaign manager with the California Black Power Network. Krista has previously worked on high-level consulting projects for campaigns, political nonprofits, non-governmental organizations, and government Whereas my mom sold clothes. 
In the spring semester of my freshman year, I read a book about the Clinton White House and how they tried to insure the uninsured, and then they failed. And that book for me was a revelation because it taught me two things. It taught me that, number one, that there were 50 million people in the country without health insurance at that time, which meant that what I had gone through and what my family had gone through was not unique. And number two, it taught me that this was not our fault. That in fact, the world looked the way that it was. It was hard for my dad to get medical care because of decisions made at the highest levels of government over the course of decades. And that's when I decided to start my career in public policy. And since then, I've been lucky enough to be at the table with big city mayors and US senators and seen them as they've made decisions that spend millions of dollars and impact millions of lives. And I cannot tell you how many times I have been the only woman in the room. The only woman in the room. Or the only person of color in the room. Or the only Asian American woman in the room. And that means that for all of us, there are people with power making decisions that impact our bodies and our families and our lives, and we are not at that table. And so that's why I'm flipping the question on its head. My entire career has shown me how important it is that we are at that table, that we are in that room. Because as a colleague likes to say, if you're not at the table, you are on the menu. Thank you so much for that. or bar the rights of a group of people within our state 
was a really shocking thing for me to see. Um, and unfortunately, America was founded on tremendous inequity that all of us, you know, that work in politics and democracy are still fighting to chip away at um, and to, to change. Um, unfortunately, in 2008, we, we lost that battle, um, and same-sex marriage was barred here in the state of California, but that's come back around, and this fall, voters in this state will have the opportunity to vote to remove that language from our California state constitution. But for me, that was really this tremendous awakening uh, we, we lost that battle, but it inspired me for um, for the fight ahead when it comes to equity, equity for our LGBTQ plus community. Thank you so much for all of your responses. Next, we'll be delving into individual questions. So, without further ado, uh, Erica, as a co-founder of Ready to Launch, talk to us about the importance of expanding the presence of women in government. What are some of the barriers women have specifically? To Um, I think of our government institutions as, you know, a lot of the infrastructure of democracy. Um, and for most of our nation's history, these spaces, these government leaders have been tremendously homogenous. They've typically been white, they've typically been male, they've ty typically come from affluent backgrounds. Um, and that has, um, such an ability to undermine the freedoms that we all receive. When we have homogenous decision makers making decisions about policy and about our lives and our freedoms, um, then our, our rights are at stake. Um, and so I believe there's tremendous opportunity to change that. Um, these careers have usually been very inaccessible, very hard to get into. We're not reaching young women and telling them these paths are available for you. There's running for office, but there's also thousands and thousands and thousands of other jobs and roles at local, state, and federal government where you can serve and be a part of you know, policy and influencing our democracy, even if you don't want to run for office. There's so many ways to get involved in public service, and so that's always my message to everyone, and our democracy will thrive when we finally have representative decision makers um, and, and that includes equal representation for women, but it, it really specifically includes women from uh, other communities that have been historically marginalized and bringing their voices to the forefront. Thank you so much. In your experience with black rights, Kristen, how would you define the historic relationship black people have in participating in democracy? And what do you believe is at stake for them in this upcoming election? Yeah, um, so as I was mentioning earlier, you know, the right to vote is really taken for granted, and black folks are not allowed to vote in this country for a very long while. You know, right after slavery, we still considered not a full citizen, three fifths of a person. Um, and through a lot of hard fought um, battles and marches and protesting and like, pushing, black folks got the right to vote. But then there were a number of barriers put in place to stop folks from voting. So, during slavery, you weren't allowed to learn to read, but then they were like, hey, there's a literacy test. Hey, now you have to register. Hey, now you have to go through all of these different processes in order to be able to take this vote. Um, we're seeing that similarly today. Um, a lot of the processes that we have now that create barriers to voting for communities of color are an extension of these, um, of what happened during slavery to include black folks. It's now just expanding to other communities as well. And so now, you know, there are a lot of states that are trying to implement ID requirements, which is really rooted in trying to um, stop immigrant folks from voting. There are these about voting disenfranchisement things. There are, you know, a lot of different various language access barriers. Folks need ballots in language and often, you know, folks are not provided those materials. Um, so there are all these ways that barriers are created to voting, and the reason why is because of the power that is in voting, the power that folks have to change and influence and make decisions um, about what is going on in our government, about who represents us, about the policies that get passed. Um, so what's at stake in November is what's at stake really every election, but it is your local budgets, it is the people who are making decisions for you at the state level, at the federal level, it is our reproductive rights, it is 
you know, our freedoms, our civil rights freedoms, because every single election we're making decisions um, about people who are making and putting policies in place that last few years after they are out of office. So, for example, you know, a lot of the dangers and the things that we're facing in terms of threats against our reproductive rights are a result of the Trump presidency that was years ago because of the power that he had to put people in place on the court which was making decisions for these things. And so all of it is really interconnected. All of these different bodies are interconnected. So our courts are connected to our um, legislatures and you know the local agencies are connected to our governor and all of this power that they have is given to them by being the voters. And so that's what it is to say we all have the power to choose people who you want to make sure that we represent you in the ways that you need and have a fight for the things that we need. So. Thank you so much for that inspiring perspective. Next, Candace, uh, your organization works to increase participation in Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the census and redistricting. What are these? Why are they important? And what do they have to do with democracy? All right, who here has heard of the census? has heard of redistricting. Wow, you're the most civically literate group I've ever met. Okay, so what's the census? Can someone just shout out? Population, yes. So what about the population? Mm -hmm. It's about figuring out information about the entire population in the United States without counting us and knowing who we are and where we live. And it's important because it helps to decide how much money, public dollars, go to your communities, and it helps to decide what our political jurisdictions look like. And I'll get to that in a moment. All right, so redistricting. A lot of you know what redistricting is. Can someone throw out maybe a little definition about what redistricting is? Feel free to just like yell it out. Because we're loud. And that's how we get heard. We are joined by redistricting expert. That is exactly right. It's about redrawing the lines of political boundaries. And districts. So, for example, I live about 10 minutes south of here, down La Cienega, and I live in a neighborhood called Faircrest Heights that nobody in LA has ever heard of, um, which means I live in a number of political districts. So, I live in the state of California, where I'm represented by two senators, one of whom spoke to you on video. But I also live in, at the state level, an assembly district and a senate district, where I'm represented by elected officials who make decisions in Sacramento. And on the local level, I live in a city council district, CD10, as well as an LA County Supervisorial District, uh, SD2. And even though the state of California looks the same year after year, all those other districts have to be redrawn. City council districts, state assembly, state senate, LA County Supervisorial Districts, and they have to be redrawn every 10 years after the census to make sure that the districts are roughly of equal size. The great thing about both of these processes is that they're public. They are supposed to be processes where all of us get to participate. And so that's what my organization does. My organization makes sure that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are counted in the census. And usually we are undercounted. Why is that? Because the census is a hard thing to learn about. You don't like grow up learning about the census. There isn't someone with a microphone telling you how to use a tampon and also why the census is important. So we have to get out there in our streets, in our communities, in our homes, at our houses of worship, at our supermarkets, and tell people why it's important to answer the census. And tell it to them in the language that they speak or understand. Who here is, identifies as API? All right, awesome. So we're super diverse. We speak over 100 languages as a community, which means that when we talk to each other about the census, sometimes it has to be in one of those 100 languages other than English. Now, when it comes to redistricting, 
There are all sorts of different groups that draw the boundaries for redistricting, usually commissions, sometimes elected officials, etc. But they're supposed to draw them with your input. And if you tell them, don't break up my community, they're supposed to listen to you. So it's really important that when someone is redrawing the lines, that all of us in this room are out testifying in front of those decision makers to tell them not to break up our communities. And that's what we also do here at AAPI Equity Alliance, is we help people understand what is redistricting and how they can participate in what's supposed to be a public process. Um, you know, we say that these things are public, right? Public officials do public processes, work in the public dollars. But we have to ask ourselves exactly how public are they? Who do we mean by public? Who gets to participate? What my organization tries to do is make sure that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders get to be in that room. Thank you so much, Candace. Uh, that was a great perspective, especially about participating in democracy for any community, really. Uh, with that, I'd like to get into our final question, which will be an open question to the panel. What is at stake for your communities in this upcoming election? Erica, when it comes to women, Kristen, when it comes to the black community, and Candace, when it comes to the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. Thank you. Um, thank you for this question. Um, well, I think it's really important to, to first frame this that women aren't a monolith. We're not a homogenous community. Um, all of our identities are intersectional. Um, and so when we're talking about, you know, what's at stake for women, um, there are a, a really a tremendous amount of things um, at stake for different communities um, across, you know, the female population. Um, definitely reproductive rights are, uh, you know, a huge topic right now. I think there's a lot of national attention um, and those rights are under attack. Um, but I think we should, um, we should understand that so many of our rights um, can be challenged. Democracy at the end of the day is just us. It's just us, the people who participate in it, who give it power, um, and the institutions that have been built um, in our democracy are not guaranteed. They are something we have to continue to fight against if there are institutions within our democracy that are unfair and unequal and unjust, uh, or the things we have to fight for if they are with uh, systems within our democracy that are upholding our rights. Um, and so I just encourage all of you to know that your voice matters. Um, that's why, as Kristen explained, there have been so many efforts to limit the vote for communities of color and for many marginalized communities. And so just remember that your voice is important. There's so much at stake, all of our rights, and um, democracy is us at the end of the day. Um, and we will safeguard its future together. Like Erica said, what we can do.
do with our own bodies is at stake. And like Christian said, our democracy is at stake. I mean, in 2016, if someone had said to you, in four years, there will be a horde of people with guns attacking the Capitol in order to subvert the results of a legitimate national election. I don't think anybody in this room would have believed that that was going to be true. But this is what can happen in four years. What else is at stake? Who we're allowed to love? What our communities look like? How safe we are? Whether we can vote and how hard and easy it is to vote. And for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in particular, whether we're incarcerated, whether we're deported, whether we're surveilled, we've seen examples of that throughout history, how the government has targeted and scapegoated members of the Asian American Pacific Islander community, whether it's something like the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II, or the profiling and surveillance of Muslim Americans and South Asians after 9-11, or today in the rise of hate against people who are perceived to be Chinese or some sort of geopolitical threat. And so I really strongly echo what my fellow panelists have said and what you heard me say, which is that somebody is going to make these decisions about what's at stake. Someone's gonna make a decision about what you can do with your body and who you're allowed to love and what your neighborhoods look like and whether your parents can get health insurance. And so, we just think that person should be you. You should be the one making those decisions. So that's why it's important to do everything you can, whether it's something like voting, or even something as simple as just sharing your story, the way that you heard all of us share a story. Because it's by sharing your story with people with power, and by voting and getting out there, that you can exercise your power. So with that, let us all remember the gravity that we hold in shaping our future and the power of our voices, both individually and collectively. Let's give our panelists a final warm round of applause. And thank you.